Thank you. Uh, does the microphone work? Can you hear me? Okay. It is great to see the whole room of bright young people. At the same time, I see here my distinguished colleagues. And so I want to apologize to young people for being sometimes too technical and to the distinguished colleagues for being sometimes too elementary. Well, mathematics has always followed technological progress and has always been a part of it. In ancient times, there were problems of measuring land, and so they appeared geometry. Then electromagnetism brought to life the study of partial differential equations, then hydro and aerodynamics led to complex analysis. I would like to continue with more uh, modern examples of artificial intelligence, the so-called big data, which is all applications of existing mathematical methods and the corresponding new theory is in the making. But there is another side of mathematics, proof. In experimental sciences, the criterion of truth is repetition of experiment. Whatever you claim has to be independently confirmed in other laboratories. In mathematics, it is Her Majesty proof. John von Neumann said that, oh, don't mention proofs to me. This concept changed several times during my lifetime, that is, von Neumann's time. At the same time, it is amazingly stable. If you open the book of Euclid, written more than 2,000 years ago, proofs there are basically still proofs. Now, what is a proof? I will say a phrase for which I have been much criticized on the net, but I will say it, that I think that a proof is what is considered to be a proof by all mathematicians. People would like to see somewhat more formal definition as a sequence of deductions, axioms at the beginning, but in more than 40 years of my career, I have never seen such proofs. Well, now mathematicians should better agree about what is a proof, and they basically agree. In general, it's best to do mathematics with absolutely freedom uh, to think about what you think is important, but very close communications between mathematicians lead to strange phenomena that they operate as a single mind, work on the same problems, which leads to priority disputes. Now, what is the purpose of the proof? The purpose of the proof is understanding. It is not enough for mathematicians to know if uh, a fact is true or not. Mathematicians want to know why it is true or why it is not true. That's why I'm slightly skeptical about uh, possibilities of uh, machine, you know, machine-checked proofs. If somebody tells me that this is correct because it was checked by a computer, but I don't understand why it is correct, it is an unsatisfactory situation. Actually, now there are strange things that never happened before. Uh, there is a, one of the biggest uh, challenges in algebra in the 20th century was classification of finite simple groups. Now, majority, practically everybody agrees that it has been achieved, but the text is on more than 10,000 pages. Uh, huh. The new situation, a proof, but I don't understand it completely. Now, what is beauty? If you listen to a conversation between two mathematicians, you may think that this is a conversation between two artists because they think that this is beautiful, this is ugly. 
probably this is true for all sciences, that for all those inside, this is art. Maybe in mathematics it's slightly more pronounced. Maybe not. Now, what is beauty in mathematics? It is, uh, you know, beauty is in the eyes of a beholder. <laughs> but there are some general features uh, that mathematicians like to see in what they call beautiful. For example, a simple statement and a complicated and deep proof. Some unexpected ideas that come from a different area and generality when the same ideas in different form appear in different contexts. The golden standard of beauty in mathematics is Galois theory. Now this is supposed to be a picture, a portrait of Evariste Galois, a French teenager who was killed at the age of 20. He did not have any formal mathematical education. He failed entrance exams and people who knew him later said that that might have happened because he understood mathematics much better than his examiners and never made any attempts to hide it. Anyway, the night before duel that led to his death, he wrote a very detailed mathematical letter to his friend. And so his mathematics stayed with us. And by the way, this is nonsense that this is a portrait of Galois. You can find it on internet, but nobody knows how Galois looked. Uh, he was a teenager who was not interesting for anybody. Who would make his portrait? And there were no, no selfies at that time. So we don't know how he looked. I will say a few words about what he did. Depending on how, when you finished your middle school, uh, you may remember formulas for roots of quadratic equations. There exist uh, formulas for, hmm, 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 uh, yeah, formulas also for cubic equations and even equations of degree four. Nobody remembers them, but so what? For many years, people tried to find similar formulas for equations of degree five. And then after many years of unsuccessful attempts, uh, well, they wondered maybe these formulas do not exist. The first credible attempt to, at a proof was made by Paolo Ruffini, an Italian mathematician, but uh, it contained a gap. And we all, know, we all know that a proof with a gap is sort of not a proof. Uh, for all his life, he tried to patch this gap unsuccessfully. Uh, still, there were many very interesting ideas there. And the first correct proof was obtained by another young genius who died young, a Norwegian, Niels Hen Henrik Abel. Galois, uh, building on ideas of Lagrange, explained what is going on. In a way, he asked the right question. It turned out that whether an equation, uh, whether roots of an equation can be expressed by these formulas or not, depends on certain symmetries between the roots of the equations. So Lagrange and then Galois ask the right question. The right question was, what are the symmetries? Every object has symmetries, whether it is elementary particles or uh, ornaments in Alhambra. And these symmetries share the co some common features. For example, you can, a, a symmetry is some transformation of a system that uh, turns it into itself. And symmetries can be performed one after another. It's like multiplication. Symmetries can be reversed. It's like inversion. So these are common features that led 
led to emergence of one of the most fundamental concepts in mathematics, the concept of a group that captures the study of symmetries. So Galois asked the right question. And when in the 20th century physicists started to study elementary particles, they knew which question to ask, the question about symmetries. Now I will quote from Sheldon Glashow. I heard it from him, so I attribute it to him that he said, I don't know if the God exists, but if he exists, then he knows group theory. It was about elementary particles. Uh, Hermann Weil, one of the top mathematicians of the 20th century, called the work of Galois the most influential mathematical work ever written. Now, speaking of art and science, I want to quote from Hermann Weil. My work has always tried to unite the true with the beautiful. And when I had to choose one or the other, that is when beautiful and true did not coincide, I usually chose the beautiful. And here is the illustration. By the way, this is Hermann Weil. And this is uh, his photo. Uh, after Einstein, Einstein uh, published um, his work on relativity theory, Weil wrote a beautiful paper um, where he made an attempt to unify all field theories. And he sent it to Max Planck, who was the editor of the journal. And naturally, Planck said it to Einstein for refereeing. And Einstein wrote that this is a beautiful paper, but it implies some experiments. And the experiments do not confirm the conclusions, so it's wrong. What did Planck do? He did an amazing thing. He published the wrong paper. And in the same volume, he published Einstein Referee Report. Now, in 10 years, when people started to study Gauge invariance and quantum mechanics, these models of Weil beautifully worked if you put slightly different contents in these mathematical models. Uh, so again, how do mathematicians know what is beautiful and what is not? Uh, I think it is in the, the same. How do uh, students of musical academy know which music is beautiful? They listen to music of greats, of Mozart, of Beethoven, Bach, and they develop their tastes. In the same way, students in art schools copy the paintings of great masters. Why? Just to develop taste, to know what is beautiful. By the way, tastes uh, evolve in time. I'm not sure that all modern musics would be considered um, beautiful in the time of Mozart. Maybe the same happens with math mathematics. Mathematics is a very strange art. On one hand, it is very, the most elitist art, because millions of people can enjoy Jaconda or other great painting. How many people can enjoy a beautiful paper in number theory? Maybe 10. At the same time, it is the best supported art, because it is supported not by endowments for arts, which is notoriously short of, in America at least, which is notoriously short of money, and maybe the current government will close it at all. It is supported by industry, by military establishment. Why? <laughs> and the biggest employer of specialists in algebra and number theory in the United States is the National Security Agency of the United States. Why? Uh, I 
<laughs> you know, I'm sure that even before ancient Greeks, people knew some important formulas. Otherwise, how could they build pyramids? But we like to trace our ancestry to ancient Greeks who made an art of mathematics. And this art turned out to be amazingly productive. Why? I think that, and this is the most, this is the abstract, pure art. Uh, pure intellectual art. That's, that's why there are no pictures in my talk. Because maybe in the, in the abstract world of uh, complete freedom, uh, mathematicians could make wild associations, develop abstract and strange theories that turned out to be the most useful. Also, the art side brings passion into the subject. Let us consider some examples. Evarist Galois developed the theory of finite fields. Now, we all know real numbers and complex numbers. What is good about them? You can add these numbers, you can multiply them, you can even divide by a non-zero number. And Galois invented finite systems that enjoyed all these beautiful properties. By the way, I don't know why he did it. I understand why he worked on solution of equations and radicals, because at that time everybody worked on it. But why finite fields? A joke of a genius. I, the, the simplest example of a finite field. If P is a prime number, then you can divide by it with a remainder. And remain, possible remainders are well, 0, 1, 2, up to P minus 1. So there are P remainders. Mm. Mm. Okay. <laughs> uh, you can add them and you can multiply them. But if you take two of these numbers and add them, it may happen that the sum is bigger than p, so it's no longer a remainder. So you have again to divide it, with the, and, and the remainder is declared to be the sum, or the product. So if p is equal to 5, then 2 plus 4 is equal to 1. Because it is 6, and the remainder of 6 modulo 5 is 1. 2 times 4 is 3, by the same logic. And uh, these objects follow, have the same nice properties as real or complex numbers. Now, let's consider some applications. A message is usually a sequence of zeros and ones. Zero and one are remainders modular 2. So they are elements of the Galois field that consists of two elements. Now those of you who had a course of linear algebra recently may remember that an n tuple of, is an element of certain vector space. So a signal is an element, is an n tuple, therefore an element of a vector space. Suppose that you sent a satellite and the satellite sent you a message. And uh, in the process, there are noises, and what you get is not what was sent. So how can you guess what was sent? This problem was solved. I don't know if it's credited to Claude Shannon or uh, certainly to people in Bell Laboratories at certain time. On the Earth, we decide, we choose some subspace, which is called a code. And we decide that all messages will be elements of this subspace. So if you got a message that does not lie in the subspace, then there was a mistake. So what do you do then? 
you have to choose an element in the subspace which is closest to it. Closest in which sense? So you need to define some distance between n tuples. And we, we define Hamming distance. The distance is the number of positions where two vectors are different. It's called in honor of Richard Hamming, another pioneer of coding theory. Now, you want all elements in this subspace to be far from each other. Otherwise, you risk that there will be two closest elements and you won't know which one. This is called Hamming weight of a code. A good code is a code with a large Hamming weight. Now, there is an amazing example of a binary Golay code. The length of this uh, sequences is 24, the dimension of the subspace is 12, and they're amazingly far from each other. Hamming weight is 8. I won't explain how to get that subspace, but it is an amazing fact that it exists. And when Americans sent Voyager uh, to Jupiter and Saturn, this code was used to send messages. And this is the standard for high-frequency radio in the United States. And it has huge applications in mathematics in, in many, many areas. Another example, public cryptography. Before, if one general wanted to send a message to another general, while well, they agreed on a certain page in some very thick book, War and Peace, and uh, that was used. And it wasn't very difficult to break this code, but a new reality was that each time when you log in to your email account, you exchange some coded message with your provider. And each time when you get money from ATM machine, you again exchange coded message with your bank. And hundred billions of people do it. And these passwords have to be changed from time to time. So old methods absolutely did not work. And mathematicians came up with a brilliant solution entirely based on finite fields of Galois. Here is the solution. Uh, I will explain the Diffie-Hellman protocol. Uh, even before it was discovered uh, within the National Security Agency, naturally was not published. And then NSA was very angry when it was rediscovered and published. So suppose that Alice wants to exchange a code, a secret with Bob. And Catherine is a hacker. Don't read too much in names, it's just ABC. There are another methods due due to Rivers, Shabir, Edelman. So consider again a finite field of Galois. Remain this modular P. Alice has a secret number, A, and Bob has a secret number, B. Galois proved that if you throw away zero from this finite field, then the remaining P minus one elements, well, for those of you who had course of abstract algebra, it's a cyclic group. I said that group is one of the most unifying and basic concepts in mathematics. If you go to a, a deserted island in the ocean and you are allowed to take only three mathematical concepts with you, think about group. So let G be one, one of the generators. Alice takes a, a G to the power A and sends it to Bob. Bob gets G to the power A, takes it to the power of sec his secret number, and gets G to the power AB. Bob sends G to the power AB to Alice. Alice gets it to the power of her secret number and gets the same element. So they share this secret. What about Catherine? Catherine knows G because everybody knows G. She knows G to the power A because Alice sent it to Bob. 
She knows G to the power B because Bob sends it to Alice. But in order to know G to the power A, B, she needs to know A and B. If this were real numbers, she would take a calculator, take a logarithm, and that would be it. But these are not real numbers. These are elements of the finite field of Galois. And that leads to the problem of discrete logarithm. And so far, there are no good methods to solve it. Again, a very strong player, like a state, with very strong computers, can do it just by exhaustion. But if you're an ordinary person, who would do it to you? If you are not an ordinary person, you would protect your secrets better. OK. Another application, uh, which is used, by the way, in iPhones. In 2001, the National Security Agency announced a competition for the best encryption system. The competition was won by two Dutch mathematicians, Demon and Ridgman, and it's called Rheindahl. The message is four by four. OK. Uh, we, we all know that bit is zero or one. A byte is a sequence of eight bits. So how many bytes do we have? Two to the power eight, 256. Galois proved that for every finite field, the order is a power of a prime number. And for every power of a prime number, there exists one fine, exactly one finite field of that order. So there exists a field of order 256. We send four by four metrics over that field. How do we encrypt it? Oh, we do usual procedures, add one row to some elementary transformations. We add keys. But at some point, we do something very strange, the so-called S-box. You know, without S-box, this method wouldn't win a competition. We invert all elements. It's a field you can divide. What if some element is equal to 0? We say the inverse of 0 is 0. Why do we say that? It's related to the question, how do we invert? Again, those of you who studied abstract algebra and maybe remember Lagrange theorem know that the, in a finite group, the inverse is a power of order of the group minus 1. In this case, to find the inverse of an element A, you, you have to take it to the power 254, and 0 to any power is 0. When there was a um, terrorist act recently in San Bernardino, California, FBI wanted to read the iPhone messages of the terrorist. And Apple refused to provide password. And they broke it. But that's a very strong player state. Another example. In 1917, a respected Czech and Austrian mathematician, Johann Radon, published a paper um, how to recover functions on a plane by values um, along, uh, of integrals along segments. Radon was not like Galois. He was a professor, a member of Austrian Academy of Sciences. Uh, it was a good paper, but uh, he did not make headlines. And then, in 1970, Cormac and Hounsfield invented tomograph and got Nobel Prize for it. And this tomograph was entirely based on formulas of Radon. If you send X-rays, you can, well, uh, take in difference of a certain function at the input and output, you measure the integral of density. And Using Radon's formula, you recover the picture of density, and you can see the inside of your brain or stomach. But at too much X-rays is not good for some people, for example, for pregnant women, it is certainly not good. 
And there were ideas to use ultrasound instead. But ultrasound is weaker than X-rays. It does not go straight. It goes along certain curves. But there are no radon formulas that would recover the function by integrals over these curves. And therefore, by the way, this is the photo of radon. And therefore, ultrasound tomography is much weaker. It's purely a mathematical problem. Another application of tomography is uh, geology. You try to see behind, <laughs> below the Earth. Uh, now, my last example, how to build a good network. A good a network is a graph, finite graph. Certain vertices are connected by edges. A good network is a highly connected network. Now, for a subset of vertices, its boundary consists of those vertices that do not lie in the subset, but that are connected by one edge to some element from that subset. So if you think of these vertices as electric nodes and give current, it spreads from a subset to its boundary to next boundary and so on. And a good network is a network where it spreads fast. How can we measure it? A graph is called an epsilon expander is for every subset, which contains less than one half of all elements, I will explain why. If you add the boundary, it increases at least one plus epsilon times. So this epsilon measures connectivity of your graph. And uh, the condition that less than one half, it's because if W is too close to all the whole set, it doesn't have any room to expand. A graph is called K regular if for every vertex there are exactly, exactly K edges adjacent to it. And what we want is a family, infinite family, of say K regular graphs that are all epsilon expanders. And in this way we get highly connected. Why highly connected? Because epsilon is fixed and inexpensive graphs because you pay for edges. The best graph is a graph where all vertices are connected, but it is very expensive. And here, K is fixed. So in this way, you get huge, inexpensive, and highly connected graphs. Uh, a few years ago, I would say that this notion is entirely due to Pinsker, Erdős. Recently, some people from MIT discuss, uh, discovered the proceedings of some conference in Latvia in the 60s with a paper by Bardzin and Kalmakorov that basically contained the concept of an expander and the th what is called pinsker erdős theorem that random graphs are expanders. Kalmakorov is one of the top mathematicians of the, of the 20th century. I would assume that all his papers are very well known. Apparently, this is not the case. Okay, now, how to construct these expander families? The first explicit construction is due to Margulis, and it is again based on group theory. If G is a group with generators, finite system of generators X, uh, well, it means that every element can be represented as a product of elements from X or their inverses. We can draw a Kelly graph. Vertices are elements of the group. Two vertices are connected. If one element can be obtained from another element by multiplication by one of the generators. So it's a regular graph. And Margulis, if you take n by n matrices uh, over integers of de with determinant one, n is bigger or equal than three, and some finite homomorphic images, then, and take Kelly graphs, that was the first explicit family of good networks. And this is the photo of Margulis. <laughs> uh, after he graduated from the university and made PhD, 
for some non-mathematical reasons, he couldn't get a position in a university or mathematical institute. So he went to an applied institute of information transmission. And he felt that sometimes he should do something related to the subject of the institute. And he published that work. And after that, he did very deep works and got Fields Medal in 78 for, for these deep results. But up to now, this is his most cited work. Now, a few concluding remarks. At the beginning of the 20th century, there was an abstraction revolution in mathematics. And mathematics was reformulated around some highly abstract notions like homology, group, uh, manifold, and so on. And that was a revolution of necessity because the border of mathematical knowledge became so big that it became, you know, Einstein, Einstein explained why he chose physics over mathematics. Because he said that he could be in command of the whole subject in physics, but every narrow area of mathematics could consume all his life. And if forest becomes too thick, you have to look at roots. That's why mathematics was, became highly abstract. But it created a problem. It split into applied mathematics and pure mathematics. Before, this question never arised. Nobody would ask if Euler or Gauss were pure mathematicians or applied mathematicians. In some universities, this divorce was formal, Department of Pure Mathematics and Department of Applied Mathematics. In some universities, not formal. So there is a temptation from, for grant awarding agencies to support only applied mathematics, useful. But uh, all these mathematicians that I mentioned before, Galois, Radon, Margulis, even Jim Simons, the financial guru and, fin and founder of Renaissance Technologies Hedge Fund, would say that they are pure mathematicians. So mathematics is like a plant. All parts are interconnected. If you remove one part, that you think is not needed, the plant may die. And here is a very example of what happened to biology in the Soviet Union compared to mathematics. In the 30s and 40s, the government decided that biology should be useful for agriculture. And they mm, removed useless biologists. Well, at that time, Removed means executed. Uh, so they removed useful, uh, useless biologists. As a result, in 91, when the Soviet Union disintegrated, there were neither biology nor agriculture. Uh, as for mathematics, they even couldn't understand what are these people talking about. And mathematical school was one of the leading schools in the world. So it is more correct not to split mathematics into pure and applied parts, but rather there is, a core, there is mathematics surrounded by applications. Now there are new challenges. Before physics had huge influence on development of mathematics, maybe these new technologies also will bring to life new mathematical methods because challenges are huge. For big, all big data is just, these problems were considered before, but not on this scale. Never people considered these huge matrices that even cannot be put to memory. But, so a matrix is an algorithm that produces an entry and only with a certain degree of precision. It's a new problem. Uh, famous physicist Eugen Wigner summarized it in the phrase where every word has a meaning. 
he called it unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Think of it, unreasonable. So it should not be the case, but effectiveness. Thank you. <laughs>